O, Amoco. American Oil Company, maker of famous Amoco products, presents Edward R. Murrow with the news. Natural power. It's wonderful. It's what you get from Amoco Gas. Amoco Gas gets its high anti-knock value from a special and costly refining process without the use of an additive that can be harmful. Amoco Gas is pure petroleum. It can all burn. It leaves no harmful metallic deposit in the engine of your car. So don't bother about additives. They're not needed to give you maximum power. Make yours Amoco Gas, the premium motor fuel that needs no additive. And now here is Edward R. Murrow. This is the news. The government reports that unemployment increased by 584,000 persons in February. It was the fourth straight monthly increase. There are now 3,671,000 unemployed. In the past three months, December, January, and February, the figure on the unemployed increased by 2 million. Once again tonight, Senator McCarthy and Army Secretary Stevens are in violent verbal disagreement. An Army report says that Senator McCarthy and his chief counsel, Roy Cohn, applied pressure and threats to the Army to try to get special treatment for a former committee aide, David Schein, who was drafted into the Army. The Army report says the 27-year-old the Army, Cohn denies this, and he and McCarthy say the Army has been using this report in an attempt to blackmail the McCarthy committee to give up its search for communists in the Army. McCarthy today released an unsigned memorandum saying that Army Secretary Stevens once suggested that the committee aim its search for communists at the Navy, the Air Force, and the Defense Department. The unsigned McCarthy memorandum says Stevens offered to furnish leads and plenty of dirt for such an investigation. Secretary Stevens promptly called this utterly untrue. And the Army's legal counsel, John G. Adams, who is alleged to have had conversations with McCarthy on such things, calls the McCarthy memorandum fantastic and false. One McCarthy committee member, Republican Potter of Michigan, called for a quick hearing to determine whether what he called these shocking charges against Cohn are true. Another Republican committee member, Dirksen of Illinois, said McCarthy violated an agreement with other Republicans not to release his memorandum, at least until they had discussed the Army's report on McCarthy and Cohn. Dirksen says the present controversy has gone far enough. The three Democrats on the committee want an early hearing on the Army's report. So does Republican Senator Munt, another member. Senator McCarthy left Washington today to make some speeches in Wisconsin. Chairman Milliken of the Senate Finance Committee says the Senate will probably go along with the House on a reduction in excise taxes. He promised a battle against any further moves to cut income taxes. Chairman Cole of the Atomic Energy Committee says the committee has been checking all atomic installations for missing documents as a routine matter. Representative Pelley of Washington State says highly secret papers are missing from the atomic plant at Hanford in his state. He says the volume of the missing papers is rather extensive. In Europe today, an American military source in Frankfurt says a Russian-made MiG attacked two of our Navy planes on the German-Czech frontier. One plane was badly shot up. Both managed to land at Munich. And Belgium today joined Holland as the only two countries that have completely ratified the European Army Treaty. I am obliged to assume that most people have on their minds matters of more considerable substance than Senator McCarthy's opinion of this reporter or my opinion of him. However, it might serve some purpose to set at least some part of the record straight. Let us begin with the subject of the Civil Liberties Union. Here is Senator McCarthy's statement on that subject, recorded while he was interrogating Reed Harris. Did the Civil, Civil Liberties Union provide you with an attorney at that time? I had many offers of attorneys, and one of those was from the American Civil Liber Liberties Union, yes. The question is, did the Civil Liberties Union supply you with an attorney? They did supply an attorney. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Uh, you know, the Civil Liberties Union has been listed as a front for and doing the work of the Communist Party. Mr. Chairman, this was 1932. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's by 1932. Do you know that they since have been listed? 
as a front foreman doing the work of the Communist Party. I do not know that they have been listed so, sir. You don't, you don't know they have been listed. I have heard that mention and as a read that mention. Now here is this reporter's comment made on a recent television program. The Reed-Harris hearing demonstrates one of the senator's techniques. Twice, he said the American Civil Liberties Union was listed as a subversive front. The Attorney General's list does not and has never listed the ACLU as subversive, nor does the FBI or any other federal government agency. And the American Civil Liberties Union holds in its files letters of commendation from President Truman, President Eisenhower, and General MacArthur. Here again is what Senator McCarthy said last night when asked by Fulton Lewis, Jr. to comment on my remarks. Well, may I say that I, there are some individuals in the ACLU who are good Americans, but Murrow again was not telling the truth when he said it not, had not been listed. I have, as you see here, Fulton, the fourth report of the Un-American Activities uh, Committee in California. I quote from page 107. And this is a quotation in regard to the organization which Murrow said had not been listed. Quote, the American Civil Liberties Union may be definitely classed as a communist front or transmission belt organization. At least 90% of its efforts are expended on behalf of communists who come into conflict with the law. So that, again, Mr. Murrow is not telling the truth. I specifically stated the Attorney General's list, the FBI, and any other government agency. Someone lied. There's no doubt about that. Now let us turn to another subject. Mr. Lewis last night asked the senator to comment on a television program of which I am the editor. Here is Senator McCarthy's reply. I have no hesitation in giving it such circulation as this broadcast may enjoy. Well, I may say, Fulton, that I have a little difficulty uh, answering the specific attacks that he made because I never listened to the extreme left-wing, bleeding-heart elements of uh, radio or television. The senator may have me there. I may be a bleeding heart, being not quite sure of what it means. As for being extreme left-wing, that is political shorthand. But if the senator means that I am somewhat to the left of his position and of Louis XIV, he is correct. Now, here are the facts about that Moscow summer school. The date was 1935. I was the assistant director of the Institute of International Education. This organization dealt primarily with the exchange of students and professors between this and foreign countries. It had established offices in London, Paris, Berlin, Geneva, and elsewhere. It was largely financed at that time by the Carnegie Corporation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Among its board of trustees were such as John Foster Dulles, John Bassett Moore, Thomas W. Lamont, Virginia Gildersleeve, and others equally distinguished. This board of trustees created an advisory committee in connection with the summer school in Moscow for graduate students, teachers, and professors. Here is the list of advisors. W. W. Charters, Director, Bureau of Educational Research, Ohio State University. Harry Woodburn Chase, Chancellor of New York University. George S. Counts. Professor of Education, Teachers College, Columbia University. John Dewey, Professor Emeritus of Philosophy, Columbia University. Stephen Duggan, Director, Institute of International Education. Hallie F. Flanagan, Professor of English, Vassar College. Frank P. Graham, President, University of North Carolina. Robert M. Hutchins, President, University of Chicago. Charles H. Judd, Dean, School of Education, University of Chicago. I. L. Candle, Professor of Education, Teachers College, Columbia University. Robert L. Kelly, Secretary, Association of American Colleges. John A. Kingsbury, Secretary, Millbank Memorial Fund. Susan M. Kingsbury, Professor of Social Economy and Social Research, Bryn Mawr College. Paul Clapper, Dean, School of Education, College of the City of New York. Charles R. Mann, Director, American Council on Education. Edward R. Morrow, Assistant Director, Institute of International Education. William Allen Nielsen, President, Smith College. Howard W. Odom, Professor of Sociology, University of North Carolina. William F. Russell, Dean, Teachers College, Columbia University. H. W. Tyler, General Secretary, American Association of University Professors. Ernest H. Wilkins, President, Oberlin College. John W. Withers, Dean, School of Education, New York University. Thomas Woody, Professor of History of Education, University of Pennsylvania. Harvey W. Zorbaugh, 
Director, Clinic for the Social Adjustment of Gifted Children, New York University. Some of the persons on that list are now dead, but presumably not yet immune from the senator's attentions. It was and is a rather distinguished list, and I plead neither ignorance nor youth as the reason for my name being on it. The Russian authorities abruptly and without satisfactory explanation canceled the proposed summer school before it began, and most of the prospective members spent the summer traveling in the Soviet Union. I did not accompany the group to the Soviet Union. No effort was made to revive the venture, and the advisory council was therefore dissolved. The Institute of International Education continued to arrange student and professorial exchanges and to make arrangements for American students to attend the summer sessions in various foreign countries, but not in the Soviet Union. I believed 18 years ago, and I believe today, that mature American graduate students and professors can engage in conversation and controversy, the clash of ideas, with communists anywhere under peacetime conditions without becoming contaminated or converted. To deny this would be to admit that in the realm of ideas, faith, and conviction, the communist cause, dogma, and doctrine is stronger than our own. This reporter declines to admit that, but remains uncertain as to Senator McCarthy's position on this matter. This is Ed Morrow. I'll be back in a moment with the word for today. Now, here is Bob Dixon. Amoco gas was used in the cars placing first, second, and third in the big Florida International 12-hour Grand Prix last Sunday at Sebring, Florida. In fact, without a single exception, every one of the great sports cars entered in the Sebring Grand Prix used Amoco gas. Such a race is a grueling test of a car and of a motor fuel, too. The grind lasted for 12 long hours, from 10 in the morning until 10 that night. And when Skyrocket signaled the end of the race... The overall winning combination was declared to be Sterling Moss and William Lloyd driving an Oscar. They used Amoco gas. Second place was won by Porfirio Rubirosa and Gino Valenzano driving a Lancia. Third place was awarded to Lance Macklin and George Huntoon driving an Austin Healey. Amoco gas was a natural selection for these great sports cars because it permits full power for highest sustained speeds. It's safe for your engine, too, because it leaves no metallic deposit that can rob power from your car. Why don't you try Amoco Gas, the one premium gas that needs no additive? That's my word for today, and here's Mr. Murrow with his word for today. This seems to be the open season for quoting Lincoln. Last night, Senator McCarthy quoted from a Lincoln speech of 1838. I'd like to read you these words from that same speech. I hope I am over wary, but if I am not, there is even now something of ill omen amongst us. I mean the increasing disregard for law which pervades the country, the growing disposition to substitute the wild and furious passions in lieu of the sober judgment of courts, and the worse than savage mobs for the executive ministers of justice. Good night, and good luck. Tonight, on the CBS television network, Amico invites you to join Edward R. Murrow when he visits person to person in the homes of a couple of people you have probably heard about. The first stop tonight on person to person will be in New York City, where the president of RCA, General Sarnoff, and his wife live. And then on to Washington for an informal visit with Secretary of the Treasury and Mrs. Humphrey. That's tonight on CBS television, Ed Murrow, person to person, with General and Mrs. Sarnoff and Secretary of the Treasury and Mrs. Humphrey. This is the CBS Radio Network.